you all for worshiping. All right, you guys have got the handouts. Get out your handout, get out your Bible. We are in the book of Jonah. We are in Jonah. We are in chapter 3 tonight. And uh, I'm excited about this because as this progresses, we see that, uh, you know, Jonah had run from God. God took Jonah through some discipline, put him in the uh, stomach of a large, very large fish, took him for a long ride for three days and three nights. And as we ended last night, God had that fish vomit uh, Jonah up on shore right into the city uh, around the outskirts maybe of Assyria uh, going to the city of Nineveh. And so what we're going to look at tonight is, is that God still sends Jonah. God still sends Jonah. Uh, my first point tonight is this, that God spoke to Jonah again. God spoke to Jonah again. I think oftentimes when we fail, we feel like God's going to give up on us. We feel like God is going to like turn, turn his back on us. And God never does that. God never gives up on us. Even though we might give up on him at times, God never gives up on us. He's always seeking to change us. He's always seeking us. He is the one who came after Adam and Eve in the garden. I want you to think about that. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, their eyes were opened to their sinfulness. And they immediately tried to hide from God. They not only hid their nakedness, but they tried to hide. And God walked into the garden, and in the book of Genesis, it says, God said, where are you? Not because he didn't know where they were. He wanted them to see where they were. In other words, where's your heart? Why are you running from me? God has always been the one to seek us. God's always been the one to reach out to us first. And even though Jonah had failed, God did not give up on him. So take a look at verses 1 and 2 in Jonah chapter 3. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. God says, I'm about to give you my word one more time, Jonah. Here we go. Verse 2, he says, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. Now, God does not have it recorded in here what he was going to tell him again. We know in Jonah chapter 1 that God had told him, you're going to go cry out against this nation. You're going to tell them my judgment's coming unless they repent. So we know that from chapter 1. Did God change anything in his message? I doubt it. He probably reminded Jonah, this is what I want you to proclaim. This is what you're going to proclaim. And that's my command to you. God made it clear to Jonah again for him to follow. God does that with us every single day. How does God speak to us today? Does he speak audibly? Well, I've never heard him audibly, but I tell you how he does speak right here through his word. If you don't choose to open his word, guess what? You're not going to hear him. Now, you can claim to have a feeling, and you can claim to say, oh, I think God said, let me tell you, if it doesn't line up with this, it's not God. It is not God. I don't care what your feelings tell you. Matter of fact, the Word of God tells us in Jeremiah that our hearts are wicked and deceitful, and they will lead us in the wrong path. There's too many people that live their lives based on how they feel instead of based on God's truth. When our feelings don't line up with God's truth, you know what's got to change? Our feelings. We've got to bring our feelings in line with God's truth and not the other way around. We don't try to fit God's truth into our feelings. That's when we begin to misinterpret what God has to say to us. Jonah didn't feel like going to Nineveh. We know that. Jonah, matter of fact, he felt so much against it that he ran. But it didn't change God's truth. When God came back to him, he said, I'm going to speak to you one more time. And here's what you're going to do. I haven't changed my plan. My plan's going to remain the same. You're going to go to Nineveh, and you're going to proclaim my judgment on them unless they repent. My second point under number one, or I should say my sub point is this. God's grace is blanketed in God's kindness. God's grace is blanketed 
in God's kindness. What did God show Jonah? He lovingly disciplined him, but then he showed him what? Incredible kindness. He had that fish throw him up, throw him up on the beach. And then God said, let's talk. Let's talk. I love that about our Heavenly Father. I love the fact that he does not give up on us no matter what we've done wrong. No matter how bad we've rebelled, God does not give up on us. He'll pursue us because of his incredible grace. An acrostic I learned way back in the 19, probably 1970s, maybe 1980s. None of you were around. Anyway, but back then I remember someone telling me, this is what grace stands for. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. God gives us his riches because of what Christ did for us. God's riches at Christ's expense. God giving us what we don't deserve. Did Jonah deserve a second chance? Absolutely not. But God showed him his grace because of his kindness. God blankets us with his grace because of his incredible kindness. It's because of God's kindness that we even have life to breathe. We have air to breathe and we have a life to live. It's because of God's kindness that we're still here. Think about how many times you and I, and I include myself in this, how many times we've rebelled, even as Christians, against God. And he goes, you repent. Christ died for you. I forgive you. He loves us that much that he does not give up on us. We've got to constantly pursue him, but he does not give up on us. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, it says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, when, verse 5 tells us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And then in verse 6 he says, and raised us up with him. That is, raised us up with Christ. And seated us with him. Seated us with Christ in the heavenly places. Why? Verse 7. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Do you realize as a Christian that God sees you seated with his son right now? That's exactly what he says there in verse 6. When he gave you life through the Holy Spirit, he says, I have raised you up to new life, and now I have seated you with my son. In God's eyes, positionally, we're already with Christ. Physically, we're still here. But positionally, we are in Christ. We are with him. What an incredible gift. That's why we get to have sweet fellowship with him any time of the day, any time of the night. Any time we want to call out to God, God says, I'm ready. I'm listening. Because he's blanketed us with his rich grace through his incredible kindness. Second sub point I want you to see is this. God proved to Jonah he was useful to him. God proved to Jonah, hey, Jonah, you're still useful to me. I still have a plan for you. I'm not finished with you. You know, if you've gone through any kind of rebellion, I guarantee you, here's what the devil has told you. Here's what the spiritual forces of darkness have told you. They have told you, guess what? You're useless. You have failed miserably. God can't use you. Uh, that's not what God shows us here. God says to Jonah, I'm not done with you. You failed me, yes, but I've still got a plan for you. I am not finished. God was showing Jonah, you're still useful for my kingdom and for my glory to carry out my will. If you and I would simply get, you know, get that within our hearts and realize it doesn't matter what we've done, we're still useful to our king. He just wants us to turn back and walk with him. We are his tools of righteousness because of Christ in us. He does not want us to miss what he's got for us to do every single day. That's what God wants to do. Matter of fact, in Titus chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, it says, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done, 
in righteousness, like we had enough righteousness on our own, which we don't, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. He has regenerated us. He has renewed us through his spirit who dwells in us. And he says, I've made you new. I've made you brand new. And then in verse 6 he says, whom he poured out on us. Who did, who's he talking about? The Holy Spirit. Whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Verse 7 says, why? So that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Heirs of what? Heirs of all the riches of God through Christ. Heirs of his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, his love, heirs of his kingdom. We are sons and daughters of the most high God. He is the God of all gods. He's the king of all kings. He's the Lord of all lords, which means as his children, we are royalty. God says, you're part of my royal family. You're royalty. That's how God sees you. We look at the weaknesses in our lives. We look at the faults in our lives. We look at the failures in our lives and go, not me, God. And God says, no, you don't understand who you are in me. We got to stop focusing on what we see just in this world. And we got to focus on God's truth and realize what we are in him and who we are in him. Because then he goes on to say here, he says in verse 8, he says, this is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. God says, I want you to be confident in who you are. I want you to be confident in who you are in me. I want you to be so confident that not only you're walking in obedience to me, you're walking in confidence and boldness and courage in me, but you're leading others to do the same thing. That's what God wants to do in and through us. He says, I want you to live in that confidence. He says, I want everyone who has believed in me to be able to carry out and engage in the deeds I've laid out for them. You see, God has works for every one of us. Every morning when I get up, first thing I do when the alarm goes off is I start my conversation with my Heavenly Father. And I start to talk to him. And I start thanking him for my wife. I start thanking him for our relationship. It's all the way down here. Come on, you can get it. It just started taking off right down the aisle. Um, but the thing is, he has done such a mighty work in us. He says, I don't want you to miss what I've got for you today. I don't want you to miss what I've got for you today. You see, he's planned works for us every single day. Here's my prayer as I'm praying in the morning. I'm like, God, I know I'm your workmanship. I know I've been created in Christ Jesus for good works. Father, you accomplish those good works through me today. I know what my plan is. I know what's on my calendar. But Father, if there's anything on my calendar that's not of you, if you have anything else in mind for me today, don't let me get in the way. Don't let me get in the way. When you start with that mindset, guess what? Now you're a usable tool. Every one of us have plans. I mean, if you're in school, you know you got certain classes you have to go to. And if you're in sports, you know you got to go to practice. And if you got a job, you know you got to go to your job. You know there are certain things that are on your agenda. But do you start your day saying, God, don't let me miss what you have in store? In the midst of, he knows your plan. But don't think he doesn't have works for you to do within that plan. Jonah had an agenda. Jonah's agenda was changed. God says, you're going to fulfill my plan. You're going to do it my way. God wants us to do that to bring him glory. The second thing I want you to see tonight is this. Jonah chose to obey God. This time, Jonah chose to obey God. Right choice. But you know what? <coughs> we have to make that choice every day. As Christians... Those of us that have a relationship with Christ, we've got to make that choice every day. Am I going to walk in the, uh, of the, uh, my feelings and my flesh, or am I going to walk in obedience to my king? Am I going to walk in obedience to his word? Am I going to do what he's called me to do? Am I going to fulfill his will, or am I going to try to do my things my way? When we allow our fleshly nature to get in the way, we're going to sin. When we allow our fleshly nature to take control, we're going to blow it. 
God wants us choosing him and choosing what he has for us. In Jonah chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, it says, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Now, I just want to stop right there. I love the fact that God gives us a little verbal picture there. He goes, this city was so large, if you were to walk across this city, it would take you three solid days to get across just the city of Nineveh. I told you uh, Sunday night or Sunday morning, Nineveh was a very powerful, huge city, metropolitan city. So walking across this city was going to be a three days walk. In verse 4 it says, then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk. And he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh, Nineveh will be overthrown. I think it's interesting that God gave them 40 days to get right with him. God gave them 40 days to get right with him. But also notice in verse 4, Jonah didn't walk for three days. He only walked one day's journey. We're going to see just why here in just a second. One day. Here's what I want you to see, sub point. Obedience brings God's blessing. Obedience brings God's blessing. God called Jonah to obey him. Jonah obeyed and God used him miraculously. When we obey God, we're guaranteed his blessing. Here's what God says in Luke chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. In James 1.25, God says, But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Now, I guarantee everybody in this room has asked God this. God, please bless us today. God, please bless my kids, bless my grandkids, bless my family, bless my work and my job, bless, bless. When God began to show me where his blessings come from, I quit asking him to bless me. I said, God, remind me that your blessing comes from my obedience. That if I'm looking for your blessing, I've got to obey you. Because you guarantee me your blessing when I walk in obedience to you. Now, it doesn't mean you're not going to face tests and trials. Please don't, don't ever think, oh, God goes, okay, now your life's going to be perfect. He does not promise that anywhere in Scripture. Blessing does not mean perfection. Blessing does not mean that you're not going to face tough times, because the tests and trials are what strengthen our faith. James chapter 1, God tells us we're to consider it all joy when we encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces his endurance. And we're to let his endurance have its work, perfect work in us so that we're perfect and we're complete. We lack in nothing. So it's not about the tests and trials, but it's about his favor on your life. If you want God's favor on your life, obey him. If you'll walk in obedience to him, you'll never have to question whether God is blessing you or not. Jesus said it clearly here in Luke. God said it through James, Jesus' half-brother, said it through him in James 1. God says it again and again and again throughout his word. Matter of fact, in Psalm chapter 1, Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight, verse 2 says, is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. You want to be blessed? Walk in his word. Walk in his truth. Jonah had to choose to obey God. And God said, Jonah, I can use you. Point number three, God worked through Jonah and the people repented. God worked through Jonah and the people repented. Why did they repent? Because God already knew where their hearts were. 
when God got ready to send Jonah to Nineveh, God had already been working on the hearts and minds and souls of the Ninevites. Do you realize every lost person you know, whether it's at work or at school, somebody in your family, God's working on that lost soul right now. Guaranteed. I don't, this is not in the notes, but write it down. <coughs> John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. Jesus promised his disciples, and he gives the promise to us. He said, when the Holy Spirit comes. Now, when did the Holy Spirit come? Acts chapter 1. Holy Spirit came not just to be in the world, but to dwell in believers. He said, when the Holy Spirit comes, here's what the Holy Spirit's going to do. Holy Spirit's going to convict this lost world concerning sin because they don't believe in me. Holy Spirit's going to convict this lost world concerning righteousness because I'm going to the Father and righteousness is only found in me. And Holy Spirit's going to convict this world concerning the coming judgment because judgment's coming. Guess what God was doing in Nineveh? God had been convicting their hearts. So when they heard the word of the Lord, their lives were changed. Why has God chosen to use us as his instruments of righteousness? Because he still is changing lives. If you're not proclaiming Christ to your lost friends, not just through your life, but through your lips, you're hindering them from coming to know Christ. You're his instruments that he wants to use. You're who he wants to use. Will they immediately respond to Christ? Probably not. When I came to know Christ at age 19, I was the first one in my family to surrender to Christ. My dad was lost. My mom was lost. I have two brothers, older brother, younger brother. Everybody was lost. And you know what? We all thought we were saved. You know why? Because we grew up going to church. We were in church every Sunday. My dad made sure we were in church every Sunday. I mean, I don't remember a Sunday we ever missed church growing up. From the time I was born till the age of 12, we were in the Methodist church. <coughs> As a baby, my parents, they had me christened, sprinkled. You know, baptized with a little sprinkling. I had no idea what was going on. I was a baby. But they were committed to say, we're going we're gonna to raise our son in a Christian home. They thought being a Christian was somebody that showed up in a building. At age 12, we moved. We moved from the Midwest to the Deep South. Went from Iowa, corn, growing country. That's all there is in Iowa It's corn, a lot of it. And we went to Georgia. And I mean... Deep South Georgia, 1972. I had never heard that kind of accent before in my life. But my mom and dad started looking for a church. Guess what? We found one, Presbyterian. Never been to a Presbyterian church. It's kind of like the Methodist, just a different name. We went to church every Sunday. When I turned 13 that next year, they said, you got to go through confirmation classes. I was like, okay. So I went through confirmation classes with a bunch of other 13-year-olds. We had to memorize books of the Bible. We had to go to class every week. And when I graduated, they said, now you're going to be confirmed. And I was like, okay, whatever. And they said, you're joining the church. So they, they put us in front of the church here. Guess what the, the, the pastor did? He came by and sprinkled every one of us. So that was my second sprinkling. I was lost. I just thought, this is, you know, I'm... Went from Methodist Presbyterian. I, I figure Methodist, they doesn't matter. I guess God doesn't care. I'm, I'm part of these Presbyterians. 13 to 18, we were in that Presbyterian church, and I was bored out of my mind. I never, I had a Bible. I never opened it. Didn't know I needed to. I carried it. Collected a lot of dust on my desk. At age 18, Getting ready to graduate high school, we have our football banquet. I played football in high school, and my coach was a Christian. I didn't know he was a Christian until after I became a Christian. I realized why he did what he did. But he actually invited a Baptist preacher to speak at my football banquet. I had never met a Baptist. 
Didn't know what they were like. But this Baptist preacher impressed me. And after he preached, I went to my mom and dad and I said, now that guy I'd go listen to again. None of us had ever stepped into a Baptist church. And this is Southern Baptist Georgia. So they said, well, you know, if Roger will go, maybe his brothers will go. And so they thought, let's, let's go. So we go visit this Baptist church. And it was one of those mega churches. I mean, like big. After a couple of months, my dad said, hey, we're joining. We're like, okay, we're going to go from Methodist to Presbyterian. How are we gonna, I don't know. We're going to be Baptist. So, man, on that church, when you joined, you had to go down front. This is back in 1978. I mean, you walk down front, and then they take you to a back room. Like, you know, you're going to be, you know, counseled. So we go to this back room, and we sit down with this guy. And I don't know if I think he was one of the deacons. I really don't remember. I just know we sat there, mom, dad, me, and my two brothers. And the first question the guy asked is, are y'all Christians? Well, when you're sitting there with the family, the only person that's going to talk is dad. Dad says, yes, we are. Dad says, we are. We are. He says, have y'all been baptized? My dad said, not the way y'all do it. He said, we've all been sprinkled. And he said, well, here's why we believe in immersion. He says, would y'all have a problem with that? My dad said, not at all. Guess what? That next Sunday, my whole family, we got dunked. I mean, boom, 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 boom. All five of us, we got under the water, came out. I was like, okay, now I guess I'm Baptist. I was still lost. And so was my entire family. Two sprinklings, one Duncan, and I would have busted hell wide open. Because I didn't know Christ as my King and my Lord. I had a knowledge of him here. I didn't know him here. It wasn't until a year later. I'm sitting in a worship service just like this. And that Baptist preacher was preaching. I don't remember what he was preaching on. All I remember is this. God spoke to me. Not audibly, don't freak out. But I mean, it was loud and clear in my heart. He said, you know about me, but you don't know me. And if you want to be mine, you have to die so I can give you life. And I prayed a real simple prayer. I said, Lord, I don't completely understand, but I can tell you this. If what this preacher is saying is true, if you died for me, and you'll forgive me of all my sin, you'll forgive me of my past, my life's yours. And I don't even know what that means, but I'm yours. You use me as you see fit. No bells and whistles went off. No fireworks went off. I didn't jump out of the pew. I didn't run down the aisle. I just sat there, but I know at that moment, God came in. Because all of a sudden, I had a hunger I had never had before. I actually wanted to read my Bible. I had never opened my Bible. All of a sudden, here I am. I'm a freshman in college. I wanted to go to Bible study. I actually wanted to go. Back then, we called it Sunday school. I wanted to go to Sunday. I wanted to go to the college department. I wanted to learn. And my parents thought, what has happened to Roger? Within that next year, guess what? My mom came to know Christ. Within five years... Both my brothers came to know Christ. My dad took him a little longer. I prayed for my dad for 15 years every day. And when my dad was 60 years old, he called me. Wendy and I were married. We were in our first year of marriage, first or second? Yeah, somewhere around there. They at that time had moved to Colorado. His job had transferred him to Colorado, and I remember him calling. He says, I got some news for you. And I said, what is it, Dad? He said, I did it. I was like, what would you do? He says, I gave my life to Christ tonight. Your mom led me to the Lord. I said, I just started weeping. I mean, for 15 years, I prayed for my dad. But that man was changed. He says, first thing I did, I said, what would you do, Dad? He says, I dumped out all the liquor bottles. He said, I filled 15 trash bags full of liquor bottles in our house which was not surprising. And I said, where'd you dump it? He says, down the sink. I said, you got to have the cleanest pipes in all of Colorado. I said, why didn't you just put it in the trash can? This is a saved man. He goes, I didn't want it to be a temptation to the trash man. That's how God changes you. You see, Jonah, Jonah was ready to be used because he was ready to obey the Lord. 
That's what God calls us to do. In verse 5, Jonah chapter 3, verse 5 says, Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. God used Jonah in such a way, it didn't take 40 days. He had been walking one day, and what's happening? Boom, 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 boom. People were getting saved. People were, they were repenting of their sin. Second sub point is this. Repentance is the only response to God's call. There is no other response. The first response is repentance. Repentance means this. Once you all get done writing, I want you to look up because I want you to miss this. If this is chasing the world, when we repent, if I've been running after the world, when I repent, I'm doing a 180. And I'm saying, I'm leaving the world behind, and now I'm chasing after God. That's what it means to repent. It means to turn. They turned from their sin and said, we're going to worship the one true God. Acts 3.19 says, therefore repent and return. So that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. In Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, it's not about a head knowledge. It's not about knowing God here. It's about knowing God here. Where we surrender our life and say, God, I'm nothing without you, but I can be everything with you, through you, and by you, and for you. That's what it means to know your king. The fourth point I want you to see is this. The king led the people to demonstrate their repentance. You see, when we repent, there's a change. Just like I told you, when I gave my life to Christ at 19, there was a change. All of a sudden, I hungered and thirsted for the word of God. All of a sudden, I wanted to learn the Bible. All of a sudden, I wanted to know. All of a sudden, I wanted to be a part of anything where God was working. I wanted that. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit in me. It wasn't me. It was Christ in me. Me being willing to say, God, I'm yours. And he goes, now you're usable. See, we got to get out of the way so God can take control. We're surrendering control over to him. That's why he's called king. That's why he's called Lord. Because we're coming under his authority. And that's exactly what the king did. There was a change in my dad. My dad dumped out the liquor because God changed him. If there's not evidence, guess what? You're still playing religion like I did for the first 19 years of my life. I don't care how many times you get sprinkled or dunked. I don't care how many times you say, oh, you know, I, 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 I'm going to recommit. You don't have anything to commit. When someone says, oh, I've recommitted my life, life, my life to Christ, I'm like, you don't have anything to commit to him. Nothing. Because you're nothing without him. You have nothing to give the Lord. Every talent you have was from him. Every gift you have, it's from him. You have nothing to give back to him other than a dead life because we're dead in our sin without him. He's the one that fills us. He's the one that changes us. And then we're usable because it's him in us. Picture it this way. If a carpenter gets ready to build a house, the carpenter has to have tools, correct? He has to have the right tools. Do those tools do anything on their own? But in the hands of that carpenter, that carpenter can do incredible things through those tools. Guess who you and I are to God? We're the tools. Don't be impressed with yourself. You're a tool. You're a tool. You're a hammer or you're a saw or, or, or you know, you're a nail gun. I don't know what some of you younger people probably are nail guns. I mean, but you know, the thing is, you're simply a tool. But filled with the Spirit, dude, it's a usable tool. But apart from Him, you can't accomplish anything. Jesus told us that, told us that in John 15, 5. He says, apart from you, apart from me, you can't do anything. 
but he can do incredible things through us. Well, that's what he did with the king. The king of Nineveh says in verses 6 through 9, when the word reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. That was a way of saying, I am nothing. He said, I am not king. I'm nothing. Verse 7, he issued a proclamation and said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. The people of Nineveh got it. Here's what we think. We think, oh, God, you're just my buddy. You're my, you're my pal. No, he's God. He may call you his friend, but you're also his servant and his child. Don't treat your heavenly father like buddy, buddy. When he calls you to repent, you better get your life right. Because if not, he will lovingly discipline you just like he did Jonah. The king got it. Sub point here, everyone must work out their salvation. God calls us to say there better be a change in your life. And it better be evident to everybody around. It was evident. The king was changed. It was evident. The people of Nineveh were changed. Because they repented. Philippians 2.12 tells us this. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We're in a spiritual workout every single day. We're working out what Christ has planted in us, himself through his spirit. We're coming under his authority every day. We're learning to be obedient in every area of our life every single day to honor and glorify him. In Acts 26, 20, God's word says that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Don't answer this out loud, but think about it. What's the evidence in your life besides your words? How do people know you know Christ? As people watch your life where they know you're different than everybody else because of the way you live. Everybody knew Nineveh was changed. Everybody knew there was a difference. I guarantee you those trash men the next day when they picked up my dad's trash, my dad was out there to talk with them. My dad was out there telling them, gentlemen, this is the liquor bottles I dumped out. Let me tell you why. My dad ended up working in a prison ministry for several years. He would walk into those prisons and share with those young men the love of Christ because of how it changed him. There better be evidence. If not, I would really question who you are. The evidence was absolutely out there. And God says, you better be doing deeds that are showing what's happened in your life. James 2.17 says, even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. If there's no evidence, guess what? You've got a false faith. It ain't real. Faith changes us when we surrender to the king. Last point tonight is this. God poured out his mercy and grace on Nineveh. In verse 10, it says, when God saw their deeds that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Two last things, two subpoints. Number one, repentance restores fellowship with God. And God renews us. Repentance restores our fellowship and he renews us. As Christians, every day there's areas of our lives that might get out of line. We need to not linger in it. We need to repent of it immediately. Call it out as sin and say, God, I'm surrendering. 
It restores us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, God says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. Behold, the old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. When you truly have surrendered your life to Christ, he says, I've made you brand new. You're a brand new creature in me. Live like it. Last sub point is this. We must daily pursue our fellowship with him. We have to daily pursue our fellowship with him. Fellowship means I want to be face-to-face with my king at all times. Not chasing the world anymore, but chasing him. Chasing him, pursuing him and his word. Philippians 2.13 tells us this. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's God working in you, both to carry out his work and to carry out his will for his pleasure. Do you realize when you're walking in obedience to your king, your life brings him pleasure? You're pleasurable to your heavenly daddy when you're walking with him. Don't miss what he's got for you tonight. So let me challenge you. If you came tonight and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, Maybe you're like me. Maybe you've gotten dunked even. But you know you don't have a relationship with the Lord. You kind of did it because your family was doing it. Or like me. It's kind of like my parents did it, then I had to do it, and then my, we, the family did it together. But I didn't know Christ as my king. If you've never surrendered to him as your king, you can do that right here, right now. And as an outward display of saying, I'm ready to surrender to Christ, I just encourage you like I have the last two nights, or yesterday morning, I guess, and last night, stand to your feet where you are to say, I've never given my life to Christ. I've had a head knowledge of him, but I've never surrendered my life to him. Tonight, I want to surrender my life. I want him as my Lord and my Savior. Is there anybody here tonight that they know they're not a Christian, but they're saying, tonight, I'm ready. If that's you, just stand up. Stand up right where you are, right here, right now, in front of everybody, because if you're going to stand here, it's going to give you a lot more boldness to be able to stand for him out there. But if you can't stand for him here, you'll never stand for him out there. Anybody? Making sure. All right, Christians, for you. Is there any area of your life that you know you've been lingering in, you know you've been hanging on to that is sin? And God has spoken to your heart tonight to say, you got to repent. You've been chasing the world. You have not been chasing me and my word. And it's time to start chasing me and my word again. You've got to die to that. You've got to turn away from that. And I'll renew you. Like I said, God, he gives us chance after chance after chance. He wants us pursuing him. Are there any Christians here tonight that say, I've been chasing after the world too much, but I'm ready to chase after God again. I want to get things right. I want to renew. I want to be renewed by him. He lives in you. But you know you need to confess it as sin. If it's public, it needs to be a public decision. If it's private, it's a private decision between you and God. I never try to emotionalize things, as you can tell that. But is there anybody here as a Christian that would say, I'm standing tonight, knowing I've been chasing the world, and tonight I'm getting right with my Lord. I'm confessing it as sin. If that's you, stand to your feet. Any Christians? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? I'm excited for you. What's your name? Eric. Eric. I'm, I'm, is it Eric, right? Aaron. I should know that. It's my son's name, my youngest son's name. Aaron, I'm excited for you, dude. Uh, let me tell you, just by you standing, God already knows your heart. He already knows where you are. He wants, he, he loves when we come back into right fellowship with him. I tell folks all the time, as a Christian, 
when I'll use my hands as an example. If, if this were God and this were me, when I gave my life to Christ, we became one. And as Christians, when we sin, this is what it feels like. It feels like God goes here and we go here. That's not what happens. What happens is this. I turn and he still dwells in me. And to repent means i got to turn back around. I can't be in right fellowship with my king when i got my back turned on him. When I repent, I'm restored in him. And that's what you're doing tonight. So I just want to encourage you, whatever it is that's on your heart, confess it to him and know that he loves you dearly. And he's not done with you yet. I can promise you that. Okay, I'm going to pray for you too. Anybody else? Appreciate you so much. Well, let me pray. Father, thank you for Aaron. I thank you for his heart. I thank you for speaking to him clearly tonight. And Father, I pray if there's anyone else here that needs to do the same, that they would do that. They laid their pride aside and died, died to themselves to walk with you. Father, I pray that you'll continue to do your miraculous work in us and through us. Take your word and penetrate our hearts with it, and you continue to change us. We pray this to you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you. Amen.